Good morning. Welcome to First Congregational Church of Los Angeles here in person in this beautiful sanctuary and online all over the world. Thank you for being here bright and early. Here is some background information about the composers and pieces in today's organ period concert. Michael Fontana is from Brooklyn, New York. He got his degrees from City College of New York and Cal State Northridge around the corner. He's back in Brooklyn now, serving as director of music and organist of 
Good Shepherd Roman Catholic Church. He has also been senior lecturer at St. Francis College in Brooklyn Heights. Johann Ludwig Krebs was a student of Johann Sebastian Bach in Leipzig. He was organist at the castle of Zeitz and had a court appointment in Altenburg. The Fugue in C by his teacher is the third movement of Bach's Toccata, Adagio, and Fugue, his only work that combines these kind of movements. I know that my Redeemer liveth opens part three of Handel's Messiah as a soprano aria. I'll play it without the soprano today. The title quotes the 19th chapter of the book of Job, and the text also draws from Paul. The melody has been reworked as a hymn, often set to a paraphrase by Charles Wesley. Elizabeth Krauss holds degrees from Corpus Christi State University, University of Colorado at Boulder, and the University of Missouri at Kansas City. She is organist at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Williamsport, Maryland, and a freelance recitalist. Mark A. Radis holds degrees from Boston University, the University of Cincinnati, and Eastman School of Music. He is professor of music history at Ithaca College and organist choir director at Lake Street Presbyterian Church in Elmira, New York. If you would like to visit First Church LA in the future, maybe to hear the sounds of our 18,000 plus pipes bounce from these walls here, please go to fccla.org forward slash visit. On the same website, you can find information about our music program, our album, The Mass, and the great organs by going to forward slash music. Thank you for being here in person and online.
Good morning and welcome to First Congregational Church of Los Angeles. In this place, we are all welcome and free to be who we are, to love who we love, and to search for our faith at our own pace. Our hearts are heavy from the events that have taken place this week in Uvalde, Texas. And we enter into this morning service aware that tomorrow is Memorial Day, a day dedicated to honoring those who died serving our country in military service. This morning, we conclude our Eastertide series, The Stories We Tell, Banned Books, Then and Now. Over the past six weeks, we have explored stories that opened our minds to the diversity of our shared life in this sacred time and place. One of the greatest treasures of faith exploration at First Church is finding our places in the never-ending story of the divine. This is a lifelong quest and a quest that is worthy of our time. In the midst of difficult days in the life of our country and our world, we come to be held in love's embrace and to find strength in God and in each other. And we affirm the whole universe is a gift of God. Everything here is a gift of God. We are the gifts of God to each other. We are all part of the procession of life. Let us celebrate by joining in these words of gathering. Out of nothingness, we came through birth to life with, with the, the Spirit, Spirit of God, God within, within us. From the life of God, the universe unfolded into being with, with the, the Spirit, Spirit of, of God, God within, within it. it. From the heart of God, creation goes on until the end of time with the Spirit of God within it and, and with, with our, our Spirit, Spirit within, within it. it. In this time of worship, let us embrace the God who enfolds us in all of creation. May it be so. May, May it be, be so, so for, for all of us. us. Now please stand as you are able in body or in spirit for our processional hymn.
By your grace, which is and was and ever shall be, we enter now the sacred realm, the place of deep connection with you, with each other, and with all of creation. By your grace, the walls that isolate fall. Fear dissolves into trust. Arrogance is gentled by compassion. Our need to prove ourselves is tempered by self-acceptance and humility. Help us now, Holy One, to rest in a love that helps us see our lives as part of your great unity and coherence of grace. We join with all creation in proclaiming the wonder of the universe and the glory of being alive in this, our time and place. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen, amen and, and amen. amen. Holy Scriptures tell us that we are all created in the image and likeness of God. In this place, we celebrate the mystery of who God is. We remember that our tradition is rich in calling the divine by many names. Holy One, Adonai, Ama, Abba, Loving Mother, Compassionate Father, Source of Life, Redeemer, Loving Presence. Because of this mystery, we invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer in your own tradition and language. In this way, we celebrate the interconnectedness of our lives, whether we come from near or from far. Let us now pray together as Jesus taught us. Our God, our Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. this time each week to remind ourselves and each other to live in peace and love as we serve Christ and the world. We ask this morning that God, the Creator, go on creating within us 
that God and Jesus Christ be with us in all places, and that the God in the Spirit lead us all in the dance of life. May the peace of God be with you, and also with you. We offer the peace of God to one another with a bow. It is my great privilege to get to welcome the children and youth forward for our children's conversation. Come on down, y'all. Don't we get a little music, Dr. Bull? There we go. Good morning. Let me, let me hear from y'all. Good morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> so it's a wonderful day today for a lot of reasons, but the thing I'm most excited about today, it's been years since I've heard Reverend Wally preach in this pulpit because of COVID and babies and yada yada. So let's all give Reverend Wally a welcome back to our pulpit. <laughs> And what really I'm excited about is that means that I get to have this children's conversation time, which I never get to do. So thank you for welcoming me too. I'd like to introduce you all to one of my favorite people of all times. She's a composer. Uh, she actually passed a few years ago, but we got to meet when I lived in New York and we became friends. And her name is Pauline Oliveros. And we're about to perform one of her pieces. Y'all ready for it? You've practiced? No, right, because it's, you didn't know about it. It's an improvisation piece, right? <laughs> Pauline wrote all pieces that were improv-based. Does anybody know what improvisation means? Anybody? What's that, Esme? You make it up as you go along. So you don't have to know it ahead of time because you make it up as you go along. Now, here's the real trick. We're not going to have to do it alone because they're all going to do it with us. Can you smell them sweating now? <laughs> But we're making it up as we go along, so that's really exciting. She was one of the kindest, gentlest, uh, most open people that I know. With the first time we met, I felt like we were best friends, and that continued uh, in every conversation we had afterward. Isn't that a cool thing to have in a friend? Just like every time you see them, it feels like you're home. Well, part of the reason for that is because she honed and developed her ability to make things up in the moment. She was present enough with herself and with other people, and she left us hundreds of pieces to guide us to find those moments ourselves. So this one that we're doing today is called Sounds from Childhood, and it's going to require that we all make some noise. So choir, are you ready to join us? Excellent. And uh, congregation, are you ready to join us? Yes. And now kids, are you ready to lead us? Yes. All right. There we go. So we got a whole team ready. I'm going to read to you the song, they're all instruction based. And while I'm reading it, you can kind of think about kind of what's gonna happen, what sounds you're gonna make. So this is called Sounds from Childhood, line one. There was likely a time in your childhood, some of us are quite a bit beyond childhood, but not all of us. There was likely a time in your childhood when it was really fun to make sounds, especially ones that adults didn't want you to make. Listen now. And remember when you love to make sounds as a child and relax with the feelings. Everybody listen to sounds that maybe you love making or loved to make when you were a child. In the next few minutes, we're going to choose three to five of those sounds to make. And you're going to make them in the group, and that's going to be our song. So let's begin with a nice deep breath. Everybody notice your breath. And as you exhale, let me hear it. And in a moment, after we inhale, that's going to be our preparation. Then we're going to make our first sound. And we're going to continue making those sounds and listening for the space for your sounds before and after or when someone else makes sound. We ready? So our next inhale, when we exhale, there's going to be sound. We ready? Here we go. Notice your breath.
Give yourselves a hand. That was beautiful. Thank you for your leadership on that really exciting song. Did you enjoy improvising? A little bit? Yes, okay, excellent. Yes, definitely, awesome. Well, as you go through your day, remember that you can make up sounds together by yourself and you can be with life in each moment, making it up as you go along. Thank you so much for letting me share this with you. And thank you all for sharing. <laughs>
with peace and light.
Holy One, who blesses those that mourn and do not hurry into being comforted, we sit down into the loss of those whose lives have been taken. We grieve the stories they will not live, the songs they will not sing, the children they will not have, the hope they will not offer to those around them, and the goodness they will not share with the world. Comfort their loved ones and all who grieve, we pray. God, for all that you feel in solidarity with us, we give you thanks. You weep with the heartbroken. You share in our anger over cruelty and disregard for life. You delight in our simple joys and extraordinary awakenings to new life. May your care and concern draw us more deeply into love for one another. May we be faithful companions to all who long to know they do not weep, rage, or celebrate alone. Turn our prayers this day and all days into hopeful, persistent action for this world that you are making new. Amen and amen.
This week is one of those weeks where what was planned months ago for our sermon series is overshadowed by the weight of recent events. During this season of Eastertide, we've been doing a series on banned books, both books that have been banned in recent times and the material that didn't make it into the Bible as we know it today. The book featured on your bulletin cover, Heather Has Two Mommies, is an important children's book. When it was first published 30 years ago, it was one of the first books to include a family with same-sex parents. Over the past three decades, it continued to make the list of most banned books in the US. And as we know, representation matters, especially for children. There's even a clinical term for this concept, symbolic annihilation, which means if you don't see yourself represented or reflected in society and or in media, you essentially feel like you don't exist. This book served as a source of comfort for countless children who grew up in what was considered at the time a non-traditional family, reassuring any child with two moms or two dads that they are not alone. And what is most important in a family is the love shared and not the gender of the parental figures. But looking at that bulletin cover today, well, let's just say that it hits differently than it did last week. Even before this week, I know it won't come as a shock, but it's been a rough time to be a parent. I have friends, who have been panicked in recent days that they might not be able to feed their baby because they aren't able to breastfeed and the only type of formula that their baby can take isn't available online or in local stores. Local Facebook groups have sprung into action trying to connect desperate parents with up-to-date info on which stores have certain formula in stock and giving generously of whatever formula or extra breast milk they might have available to give. And whether you're raising a baby or a toddler or a kid or a teen through years of a pandemic, this has been a trying time. Parents are weary. From the toll of the last two years of being in survivor mode, toggling between what are we doing now? Is it mass? Is it in school, at home? This one tested positive, canceled plans, juggling childcare, and then the one child gets a cold, and so they have to stay at home for a week. School systems being stretched to the brink because of lack of teachers and administrators, and everyone is doing the best they can with less and less resources. And so here we are in the season of Eastertide. And we hear the words of our scripture this morning. The story of the days that followed Jesus' death and how the women who were closest to Jesus awoke early on that Easter morning, bringing the supplies to prepare his body for what would come next now that he had died. And there's actually four versions of this story in the Bible, one in each of the four Gospels. In Luke, the version we read this morning, when the women find the empty tomb, they rush to tell the disciples what they have discovered, only to be told that the disciples don't believe them. A fun line in the NIV translation of of Luke reads, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like utter nonsense. (laughs) Peter then goes to visit the tomb to check it out for himself and finds that the women were right. In Matthew and Mark, the women were so terrified that even though they were instructed by the two angels to go and tell the disciples what they had saw, they ran away in fear and told no one. And in John, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb alone. And in addition to the visit from the two angels, she is the first to encounter the resurrected Christ, a tearful reunion, to be sure. A few hundred years after Jesus' death, there were all these different Christian communities spread throughout different countries and cultural groups, each as unique as the people who made up these communities. 
And at some point, they decided that they needed to get together and get everyone on the same page to agree on some basic theological stuff, like who was Jesus, and how was he both divine and human, and what exactly was Jesus' relationship to God? And it was also around that time that they were deciding what should be included in the Bible and what shouldn't. So you'd think, since this was a time of consolidating belief, a time where they were forcing people to either agree or be exiled, that they would have landed on just one version of the resurrection story. I mean, it's kind of the most important story of Jesus's life. Wouldn't they want to get just one accurate account or the closest they could find to that and then just throw out the other ones? Why even have four gospels, four versions of Jesus's life, each with a slightly different take on who he was and what he did and what it meant for us? Jesus' followers. Instead of throwing aside these differing accounts, they placed the four Gospels side by side, giving each of them their own space to tell the story of Jesus' life as they understood it, each version telling us something important about who Jesus was, even when it conflicted with the other stories, which in turn allows us thousands of years later, to enter into whichever Easter story we choose, to listen for the truths waiting for us amongst the pages. Okay, so now here's the hard part. Tuesday happened. An 18-year-old bought two semi-automatic assault-style rifles and 1,600 rounds of ammunition shot and killed 19 fourth graders and two teachers. You don't have to be a parent to be gutted by the events of Uvalde, Texas. But I will say that holding my baby this week, this week as she slept, knowing that the parents of those children will never get to hold them again, was a feeling beyond words. And the horror seemed to have no end as we learned about the 911 calls of the children trapped inside and as our nation grappled with the possibility that they might have lived if law enforcement had entered the classroom sooner. Guns are now the number one cause of death among children and teens in the US, overtaking automobile deaths for the first time. Over the past 10 years, the firearm suicide rate has more than doubled among Black, Latino, and Asian teens. Even though the U.S. makes up only 4% of our world's population, we own almost half, 46% of all privately owned guns in the world. And an analysis of all mass shootings at elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools found that 80% of mass shooters stole their guns from family members. Uvalde was the 27th school shooting this year. I don't share these statistics to overwhelm you, but I say them because this is our reality. I know it is so understandable to think, well, if we weren't able to do something after Sandy Hook or Parkland, Florida, or any of the 950 school shootings since Sandy Hook, or any of the mass shootings, including Boulder, Colorado, or even here in California, well, then nothing can be done. Scrolling through the memes and the opinion articles, listening to politicians go after one another, hopelessness is a perfectly reasonable reaction. I'm pretty sure that the women who visited Jesus' tomb were also filled with hopelessness, consumed with grief for the loss of the one who was the embodiment of hope, who had been murdered and buried. They had lovingly prepared ointments and spices to anoint his body. They went about the tasks at hand without hope that it would bring their loved one back. Even though the time for hoping for a miracle had passed, they got up that morning and they did the work that was theirs to do. Like the women at the tomb, we must dedicate ourselves to the work in front of us,
before the clouds of hopelessness have parted. It is in these moments when we are weary and hopeless that our efforts are needed most. And I know that some of you might feel like you can't. Maybe you are just trying to get through this moment without, feeling, uh, without falling apart, and that's okay too. But when you're ready, we need you to join us as we survey the damage and divisiveness surrounding us, they would have us believe that all is lost, that the other side is to blame, and they will never let us win. But in truth, there is more common ground to be found here than you might think. The majority of Americans, including gun owners, including NRA members, are in support of some form of le legislation that strengthens background checks and red flag laws. There are organizations working right now to get legislation passed that would help close loopholes and background checks and increase age limits for gun ownership. And it won't happen tomorrow or next week, but that doesn't mean that what we do now is unimportant. I was reminded this week by Amanda Doyle that it took a hundred year long fight for women to secure the right to vote. It took a hundred year long fight after the Civil War to end legalized racial segregation. And please, God, may it not take 100 years for us to address gun violence in our country, but what would have happened if 10 years into that 100-year-long fight, if the people had decided that things were hopeless because they couldn't see systemic change yet? We've listed a few ways that you can get involved in our meeting house this week, but I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about what specific ways you might do the work we are all called to do as Christians to bring about God's kingdom here on earth. Because if we, we have seen with our own two eyes over and over again, as Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. There was a time, pretty recently actually, when my life would have seemed unimaginable a gay woman, ordained, preaching from the pulpit, from this pulpit, with a wife I legally married, raising a daughter with the support of this congregation, and even a few other congregations who also claim her to be theirs. Because change isn't just possible, it is a fundamental truth of life. I'll end with the words of the poem, Hymn for the Hurting, written by Amanda Gorman. Everything hurts. Our hearts shadowed and strange, minds muddied and mute. We carry tragedy, terrifying and true, and yet none of it is new. We knew it as home, as horror, as heritage, even our children cannot be children, cannot be. Everything hurts. It's a hard time to be alive and even harder to stay that way. We're burdened to live out these days while at the same time blessed to outlive them. This alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must differ or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into a love that lets us live. May we not just grieve, but give. May we not just ache, but act. May our signed right to bear arms never blind our sight from shared harm. May we choose our children over chaos. May another innocent never be lost. Maybe everything hurts. Our hearts shadowed and strange. But only when everything hurts may everything change. Amen.
We are each wrapped in the unfolding of a life as we co-create the future with our God. Our story is part of the greater whole, one that transcends time and connects us across the ages. Through the love of God, we have found for each one of us. On this day, may we offer ourselves, our gifts, and our personal commitments for the sake of those who went before us, for those yet to come, and for the one whose life binds us together. Our morning offerings will now be given and received.
gratitude for the many ways you touch our lives. Receive now our offerings. And, O oh God, wherever people are feeling a lack of, a lack of love, of provisions, of connection, make your abundant presence known through these gifts and through our lives. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen. Please be seated. We would like to make sure that you are aware of some events you won't want to miss coming in June. On June 4th, June 4th, at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary, we're having our resonant collective Gamelian concert. And then the next day on June 5th, we are celebrating Pentecost here. So that will include communion as well as food at first. And then if you missed that, on June 19th, we're going to be celebrating Pride, also celebrating Juneteenth, and we'll share again in communion, and again, we'll also be having food at first. So we hope that you will join us on those important dates. Hear now this blessing as we prepare to depart. The blessing of heaven, the blessings of the earth, the blessings of sea and sky, on those we love this day, and on every human family, the gifts of heaven, the gifts of earth, the gifts of sea and sky. for the postlude. 